Hello everyone. Welcome to Digital Communication Tutorials. In this video, I am going to discuss the natural sampling procedure. You should note this is also called as ordinary samples of finite duration. In practice, the sampling of an analog signal is accomplished by means of a very high speed switching transistor circuits. Accordingly, we find that the resulting sampled waveform deviates from the ideal waveform of instantaneous sampling and this is because the operation of a physical switching circuit however fast it should be still requires a non-zero interval of time. Further we often find that the samples of an analog signal are lengthened intentionally for convenience in instrumentation or transmission. This is well supported when I take up my next topic which is the flat top sampling procedure. For now, let us start with the natural sampling theorem. Let us start by considering a message signal G of t which is applied to a switching circuit and let the switching circuit be controlled by a sampling function C of t and let the sampling function C of t consist of an infinite succession of rectangular pulses of amplitude A, duration capital T and period Ts. And let the output of this switching circuit be denoted by S of t. Let us have a look at these waveforms. So, this is our analog signal G of t, this is our sampling function C of t, and this is our sampled signal S of t. By looking at the sampled signal, we can observe that the switching operation simply extracts the analog signal G of t in successive portions of predetermined duration capital T taken at regular intervals which is given by Ts. In simple words, wherever there is a sample or a rectangular pulse, the input signal is retained at the output and whenever the sampling signal is 0, the sample signal is also 0. Therefore, we can say the sample signal S of t consists of a sequence of positive and negative pulses. It is not mandatory to have both positive and negative pulses always in the sample signal. This is actually because our input signal G of t consists of both positive and negative amplitudes. And since we are simply going to retain the value of G of t in the sampling duration of each pulse which is capital T, we are going to have both positive as well as negative pulses. Therefore, by simple analogy, I can define the sample signal S of t as a multiplication of my input signal G of t and the sampling signal C of t. This is given by equation 1 here that is S of t which is the sample signal equals to C of t which is the sampling signal multiplied by G of t which is our input signal. As already said in natural sampling the top of each pulse retains the shape of the analog segment at that pulse interval. This is one of the most interesting characteristic of natural sampling. Let us go back and have a look at this. The sample signal S of t has a pulse the top of which retains the shape of the analog signal at that corresponding sample signal instant duration. That is each pulse when multiplied by G of t is going to create a pulse whose top is going to retain the shape as that of the G of t. This is the characteristic of natural sampling. Now, to continue the mathematical analysis of natural sampling, let us define C of t as a mathematical expression. This can be done by using complex Fourier series as C of t equals summation n varying from minus infinity to plus infinity C n which is a coefficient multiplied by e to the power of plus j 2 pi f s n into t where the coefficient c n can be calculated using the equation given here that is c n equals to 1 by t s integral minus t by 2 to plus t by 2 c of t into e to the power of minus j 2 pi f s n t into d t. Now noting that from the waveform of c of t the amplitude of c of t is a I will substitute c of t equals to a into this equation. So c n equals to 1 by t s integral followed by c of t replaced by a and the rest of the equation retained as it is. Now let us take a to the constant term that is a multiplied by 1 by t s equals to f s. Then let us integrate e to the power of x it is equals to e to the power of x divided by coefficient of x 
here the x is t and the coefficient of t is minus j 2 pi f s n. So, we will have e to the power of minus j 2 pi f s n t divided by minus j 2 pi f s into n. The limits are minus t by 2 to plus t by 2. Now, let us apply the limits to t. So, when t is equals to t by 2, we will get this term and when t is equals to minus t by 2, we will get this term. Now, we see that there is 2 in the e to the power numerator as well as denominator. Let us cancel them out. So, we will obtain e to the power of minus j pi f s n t minus of e to the power of plus j pi f s n t. In my next step, I will take pi f s and n towards the denominator of a into f s. This is done here. So, a into f s divided by pi f s n into e to the power of minus j pi f s n t minus of e to the power of plus j pi f s n t whole divided by minus 2 j. Now, let us take this minus symbol to the numerator. So, this term will come here and this term will come here and we now note that this term is equal to sin of pi f s n capital T. We should also note that we have cancelled out f s in the numerator and denominator here and therefore, we will be obtaining a divided by pi into n. So, that is retained here multiplied by the simplification of this which is the sine function. Further, I am going to take this pi into n to the denominator of sine. So, I will get a multiplied by sine pi f s n capital T divided by pi into n. Now, I want to convert this into sinc function. So, I will make this and this equal. In order to do that, I am going to multiply and divide the denominator of this term by f s into t. So, when I take f s into t in the numerator and denominator of this equation's denominator, this will be like this. So, let us take this f s into t towards the constant side. So, it will be a f s capital T multiplied by sin of pi f s n capital T divided by pi f s n capital T. This is equal to sinc of f s n capital T. This is by directly taking the property of sinc function. Right. So, let us now denote this as equation 3, which is our coefficient. Now, I am going to substitute equation 3, which is the coefficient c n into equation 2, which is our sampling function. When I do that, I will obtain the new expression given by c of t equals summation n varying from minus infinity to plus infinity a f s capital T into sinc of f s n capital T multiplied by e to the power of j 2 pi f s n now, let us take this which is equation 4 of the sampling signal and substitute into equation 1 which is our sample signal equation. So, it will be C of t multiplied by G of t. Let us now write that equation. So, S of t equals G of t multiplied by C of t. So, this complete RHS is rewritten here. Now, I am going to take the constant terms here into the left side. So, A F S capital T comes here. G of t is a continuous time signal. So, I am going to take it here summation sync as it is and e to the power of j 2 pi f s n t is taken as it is. Now, let us apply Fourier transform on both sides of equation 5. S of t will be S of f. This is retained as it is. Summation is retained as it is. Sync is also retained as it is. Then we have g of t multiplied by e to the power of j 2 pi f s n t. Upon taking Fourier transform, it will convert to g of f minus n f s. So, by looking into this equation, we find that the spectrum S of f of the sampled signal is a periodic signal because we have g of f minus n f s, but this signal is weighed by the sinc function given by sinc of f s n capital T. Figure here depicts the relationship between the original signal spectra g of f and the sampled signal spectra S of f. And we have depicted this figure by assuming that our original signal g of t does not contain any frequencies outside the band minus w to plus w. That is, the original signal g of t is assumed to be very strictly band limited. Additionally, the sampling operation is done in such a manner that the sampling rate f s is greater than the Nyquist rate 2 w. Therefore, there is no aliasing in the sampled signal spectra. It is very clearly visible here because if there were any aliasing at all, these spectra would overlap. And since the sampling rate f s is greater than 2 w, we can see there are gaps in between the spectra. Additionally, what you should also note is that the overall effect of natural sampling is to multiply the nth lobe of the spectrum s of f 
by the constant term given by A f s capital T multiplied by sink of f s n capital T. Let us look at that first. So, you see this is our original signal spectra between minus w to plus w. This is the first replica at f s. Now, the amplitude of this spectra is weighed by the constant term A f s t sink of f s n equals to 1 t because we have seen it is equals to 1 f s. So, this spectra is weighed by A f s t into sink of f s 2 capital T. It will go on in this particular manner. So, this discontinuous line in fact depicts the sink of n f s t and this spectra replication depicts the sampling procedure. Now, to recover the original signal g of t from the sample signal s of t without any distortion, we need to pass the sample signal s of t through an ideal low pass filter and this ideal low pass filter must have an amplitude response which is given by this diagram. That is, it must have a pass band where the amplitude response is flat, then it must have a guard band where the amplitude response is decreasing and finally, it must have a stop band where the amplitude response is ideally 0. By passing our sample signal which is between minus w to plus w through a low pass reconstruction filter having an amplitude response as shown in this diagram, it is possible to recover the original signal g of t from the sample signal s of t without any distortion. So, we finally conclude that use of sampling pulses of finite duration has no important effects on the sampling process. So, that is about the discussion on natural sampling. If you like this video, kindly press that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.